you know, I, I, I try to pronounce or use my new found or new learned Swahili, but I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> uh, but I must tell you, uh, only someone either from Uganda or probably uh, you know, Kenya, Tanzania can appreciate that. That uh, after a long journey, I did a slow walk there, but I went home to Karibu Dala to pay my dowry. And boy, that was an experience. Had I known that I was holding up the family by not paying my dowry, I would have done it much sooner. And I'm a much better person for it. So with that, let's invite our distinguished speaker, the former ambassador of Tanzania to the United States, no other than Ambassador Liberata Muramura. I can take a risk of saying I'm Yambo. Habari gani? Habari za jioni? Habari za mkutano? Great. Yeah, let me start by saying um, it's quite an honor and uh, I'm deeply humbled to be invited to address you. I know it has been a long day and uh, for those who have been attending since yesterday, this is like a climax. I don't want to repeat what you have been saying. I've been just asked if I could uh, try to wrap up, although I was not there, but at least I was following. So as um, what we know best, because in diplomacy allow me to thank my dear young and energetic sisters. Mary, is Mary in the room? Okay, great. <laughs> Henrietta. Yeah, so I really do want to thank you for reaching out. I know there are some people who referred you to me, but then you went out of your way. And as they always say, be careful when you deal with a very determined woman. So I heard Mary was really determined. It took a while before we could connect. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as I was um, graciously being introduced, I'm now with the Elliot School. He's an ambassador, but he's also a militant from the Naval Academy. So he decided, he said, I'm going to wear my military hat and all that we should now, in fact, should have been yesterday, have an African institute. He said, there's no way I can run an institute or a school of international affairs where African is, Africa is missing. So when that statement, then it was made, it happened. <laughs> So this um, so after he established it, and then he started looking around, who would be able to bring this things to, to where he wants it to be. So I was looked <laughs> from my retirement in Tanzania and came here. I said for Africa, I'll jump to the first flight. Yes. So so this is my short background. I will, from diplomacy to the academia. <laughs> Everyone was, when I arrived, was like, oh my God, Ambassador, you are very courageous. <laughs> what a transition. Because I was almost 40 years in the public service, and I was in diplomacy, and being ambassador, you know how it is. You are told what to say, what to do, who to meet, or not to meet. So there are the do's and don'ts. But then when I arrived at the Elliot School, everybody was like, Ambassador, welcome. Welcome to the Institute. Welcome to the Elliot School. You are free to do whatever you want. <laughs> I said, you have your freedom. <laughs> at first I was like, what do I do with this 
free of it. <laughs> because they say, if you want to teach, you can teach. If you want to write, you can write. If you want to research, you can research. So I said, all the apart. I will take it. So um, I decided to teach also. And uh, of course, they expected, because I have a background in conflict resolution, peace negotiations. So I did the first semester on conflict resolution, and then I found this was not interesting. You can't always be talking about conflict in Africa. Let's have something more interesting. So I asked if I could speak, I mean, teach about women and leadership. In Africa, they say, oh, bingo, we don't have such a cause. Yes, can you come up with the syllabus? That's the freedom you have. So I did. So now it's almost three years I've been teaching about that. And of course, also doing justice to my, to my career, I decided also to teach about diplomacy. The role of math and conference diplomacy. In global politics, in whatever area. You have been covering it from this morning. So I'm giving you this background why I accepted to come and address you at the end of the day. Because the issues that you have been addressing, and when I was walking in the panel that was here, I think that are the issues that when you are in Washington, these are not the issues that make. There's no platform for those issues nowadays if you don't make this platform. So I thought this is the time we should come up with a, a new narrative. I heard the, the, the youth talking about we need to have a positive narrative. So, in all aspects, when you're talking about health, because I remember I was here as ambassador. When the continent was hit by Ebola, you should have seen the panic in this country. But then they came up with the protocols, because this is the same protocols that don't even in that context. But mostly, we were all blacklisted, all African countries were blacklisted as Ebola countries. Hmm? Yes. And then, because our embassies, because we promote investment, we promote tourism. The tourism just fell from, for us, Tanzania, we had reached, I think, one, about one million, and almost three quarters were from the US. They just plummeted to almost one percent, just because of just Ebola, which was in different countries. So I'm saying, this is what has been missing since I've been here. We need this. We need to have this conversation. We need to get whoever is listening. Mm -hmm. That there is so much of what is happening. I remember, whoever can remember, my good friend has been writing so much uh, on this, uh, what has been happening in Africa. But if you remember, there was an economic magazine Economist magazine, which was Africa, 2000 was hopeless, and then 2010 was rising. So I don't know where we are now. <laughs> because there's so many dynamics in that continent. And uh, I was saying it would take almost the entire semester if you have to talk about the entire Africa. Because there is no template. Even for the country I come from, Tanzania. Those who knew Tanzania, you had a template which you had a dot. But now things have changed. We have a, a new dynamism, we have a new political landscape. So there's so much happening. But then I know Maria told me that um, I should talk about democracy. I don't know how deep you went in trying to understand what kind of democracy we're talking about. Our former president of Tanzania, His Excellency Benjamin Mkapa, when you have the Western countries 
coming, of course, to preach us about democracy. I was in one of his meetings when he was meeting one of these observer missions, kind of observer missions. I don't want to mention which one. He said, what? What, what democracy are you talking about? He said, you know what? I'm not here to listen to Coca-Cola democracy. <laughs> Can you please, for once, listen to us? Because Africa is, has been traditional. Has been about democracy. The institutions we had, traditionally, it was this collective consensus building. It was peaceful coexistence. It was the right. I said, I'm talking about fundamental rights. He said, we had the right to the basic needs. The right to food. The right to shelter. The right to live, survive. He said, these are the fundamental rights. The basic needs of the people. And we had this collective, collective diplomacy, collective democracy at the village level, at the community level. So I said, you are coming to preach us about democracy? But then being in the academia, you know, every time you are being in the academia, my sister, you need to have definitions. You start with definitions. So now there have been attempts to come up with a definition. I don't know in your discussion if you manage to reach what is the best definition of democracy to get a general understanding. Because there are different interpretations, different understandings of what the most of democracy constitutes. But as they say, as one, the more, uh, one scholar said, he said, you see it when it is there, it's just like leadership. And of course, you don't see it when it doesn't exist. So, I know most of the African constitution, constitutions, even maybe the constitution here, starts with we, the people, and the government for the people, by the people and for the people. Do you remember that? So what are we left with? Do we have a government by the people? Do we have government or we have government for the people? I leave that to you. But also, Sir Winston Churchill, if you remember this famous quotation, he said many forms of government have been tried and it will be tried in this world of sin and rule. No one pretends that democracy, democracy is perfect or all wise. But the alternative is the world. So for Africa and the African context, those who have written, those who have spoken, trying to characterize what form of democracy they have always argued that Africa has electoral democracy and not democratic governance. That you see democracy during the election time. I don't know whether this is typical for Africa. I guess it's the best place to move here, you also the rest of the world. When you look at how these governments come into being and those you demanded to be able to deliver on the fundamental human rights. But I want to draw you to this document. I don't know if anyone is aware that there exists the African Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Governance. This was adopted by the African Union in 2007, soon a few years after the Organization of African Union was transformed to African Union. So this was supposed to be the roadmap for all member states. This was to be a blueprint. 
It has everything made for what you have been discussing in this. Even issues of widow, migration, refugees, disabled, all the right side. Of course, organization of elections, they extend to their part. But you'll be surprised. When it was opened for signature, this was 2007, it required 15 ratifications to come in force that you can apply it. You can even use it in the court of law. It took five years to get the 15 ratifications that were needed. And as we are speaking, out of 55 countries, of African UN have been high EU member states, only 34 countries have consented to this. You will be surprised, and this is what uh, those, um, this Maria, I don't know, is here listening when you talk of democracy, bro, you need to go into these numbers. Because even those countries that are known to have been the miracle of Africa, countries like Botswana, they never signed it. <coughs> countries like Tanzania, they never signed it. But how countries who are thinkable who are part of this? So the issues, what is wrong? Is it wrong with this? Or what is wrong with us? <laughs> because when we talk of, I remember when President Obama visited, made his first speech during his visit to Africa. That's what they say here to Africa. He said, Africa needs strong institutions and not strong men. So as we are speaking, there are so many institutions that are in This is all what it takes. But the issue is why are we seeing this sometimes in this mess? Recently, we have signed, I know you have been talking about um, this year, the East African Union. So, continental free trade area. It was a big photo opportunity for everybody to celebrate. I also put to you, those who are searching to see, would this make a difference? Because you recall we had the Lagos plan of action of the 80s. We had the NEPA, which had everything that we needed. We had the regional economic communities that were supposed to be building blocks to the African Economic Union or One in Africa. Mm -hmm. These economic communities are still in existence. They all have very good programs. They all have free trade zone area zones. But then would this continent, this continent come together and have that um, achieve that milestone? I'm also putting that to you. I don't have the answer. But I was saying, if you could not let the regional economic communities lead to that, or a deal, we now say we have achieved. This building blocks leading to that economic union. That is two. We have had negotiated democracy. Does anyone know what negotiated democracy is? When we have upheavals, violence during election time. And then, of course, you have everyone coming in to find a negotiated solution. So at the end, then you have all these parties coming together to work out power sharing. So that became a norm. 
Yeah, Even sometimes when there's some of the opposition parties will see that ah, they have no means of winning yes, this election, so they will start to and then they have, <laughs> so they can come to the government. So that became also like a fashion, having this coalition government. You remember the crisis we had in Kenya in 2007-2008? Nobody was even prepared for it. Because Kenya was seen as stable, highly developed, economic power of its own. But there were very deep issues that were never addressed when that was the result of the 2008 crisis. Then we had a negotiated settlement. We had a crisis in Zimbabwe. We had a negotiated settlement. Sudan, the protests, the intervention of the army of the military, now they are in the transition with the negotiated So we have this negotiated democracy. So whether that will continue to be the trend, or what, what does that mean for the future? growth of democracy in Africa. So, so I put that also. We just come back from Addis Ababa. We have the crisis of constitutional terms. So limit term. Presidential limit. Ababa. limit. And the United Which now is very known as sad so terms. Just come back from Extending, Ababa. changing constitutions, the amending the constitutions, constitutions, holding referendums to so extend this. So the issue, because everyone will say it's the will of the people. Have this If they go to elections, they are elected, right? Continue. But then they say the whoever is making a lot of noise, they never make noise even to the, the Queen of England. Why as it's the will of the people, right? I'm putting that also to you. Now with the economic coming to the winding up, bringing this to the economic growth. I think in your discussion, for those who have a positive narrative, they say Africa is a new economic frontier. Africa is rising. So what I call, I call to anybody to this challenge. I said, yes, let us rise to the occasion. He spoke all about the resources that Africa has. Why go for the foreign aid? Hmm? You see, you spoke about it. <laughs> but then you were high. Why it's not happening? We have been saying the same language. It is since I came to know that Tanzania existed. It has been that we have been sitting <laughs> on this mine. <laughs> Field. Mm? So what does it take? Of course, everybody will talk now about corruption. Who is to blame? Yesterday, I was in a Uber with a driver who is from Cameroon. So he started, when he heard I was from Tanzania, he said, oh, Tanzania, you are lucky. You have been the most beautiful. I said, you know, it doesn't just happen. <laughs> The leadership is how much they invested. I said even to speak one language. In Tanzania, we had two, more than 200 tribes who could not communicate with each other. But the visionary president decided that we all, we are one thing and therefore we speak one language. So that is why he really, while of course the West condemned me so much, but that's what has made Tanzania to be what it is. I have Bruno here. I don't know where it comes from in Tanzania. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So you must have also spoken about the politics of exclusion. Inclusion. Now with the women champions, because we use it as no one should be left behind. So be the women, be the youth, be the elder like me, be whatever tribe, this is what uh, has made us to be to go through this cycle of violence because of living 
people behind. So through your today's conference, I hope you have discussed how no one should be left behind. Of course, we know the, the why, we know the what. Where we find ourselves wanting is the how. How do we do it? How do we do it differently? I decided to teach, and this is the final note, to teach about leadership. Because in the context of women, we are left behind. But leadership, because I believe in leadership, we have seen that a single leader, from the family level, whether it's because you the, our fathers are leaders, they can make it or break a family, break a community, break a nation, or vice versa. That a good leader can build a nation. And this is why we say, woman, you leave women behind, 50% plus of the population behind, and then you call it democracy, and you call it nation building. This is how we find for painting. I want to end with a quote from Madeleine Albright. If you remember that term, in fact, double She said, every country deserve to have the best possible leader and that it means that women have to be given a chance of course to compete in any democratic process if they are never allowed to compete in the democratic process then the countries are really robbing themselves of a great deal of resource and talent so let me end on that note by thanking you, but by saying that the conversation continues. And uh, for those who follow the politics in our region, it is a lot of continuum. Amanda. I want to invite a few of the panelists, all the panelists who are here, to go up and I want to take a picture.